I am Giselle Dixon, Vice President of Branch Programs and Services here at the New York Public Library. Two years ago, the library and WNYC launched Get Lit with WNYC, a book club for New Yorkers to celebrate the joy of reading, creating an opportunity for all of us to come together during a time when we were forced to be apart. Since the launch in April of 2020, the book club has generated about 150,000 e-book checkouts. Each checkout represents excitement around books and libraries. As a librarian, it makes me proud of our city to see such enthusiasm for books and libraries. And today, I am proud to see that readers as readers were supported. Today, I am thrilled to welcome all of you here to the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Library. While you're here, I hope you take some time to get a library card, check out some programs. We have a few featured here on our large screens. And take some time to enjoy the beautiful space that's overlooking Fifth Avenue. For those watching virtually, I welcome you as well. Hope you have an opportunity to join us sometime soon. Now, I know you are all excited to get started. Tonight, we welcome A.M. Holmes, author of this month's book club selection, The Unfolding, a story presciently unpacks a rift in American identity, prompting a reconsideration of the definition of truth, freedom, and democracy. We'll also be joined by creative pioneer, Lori Anderson, who will be named a library lion next month and who will share a special musical performance. Thank you for joining us today. And a special note of appreciation to Allison and the WNYC staff for being such wonderful partners on the Get Lit Book Club. Thank you all and I hope you enjoy the program. Now I'll hand it over to Allison but before I do so, here is a taste of her show, all of it, with Allison Stewart. Welcome to all of it. We got all of it. All of it. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> Our guest is Secretary Madeleine Albright, Brian Cranston, Tank and the Bangas, Barry Jenkins, Celia Keenan Bolger, Aaron Lee Carr, Esperanza Spalding, Gideon Glick, Helen Yoyemi, Fab Five Fred, Benga Akanabi, Brene Brown, Tony Goldwyn, Tandy Newton, Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Welcome to all of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. What a pleasure. Hi. Hi. This is so fun. I'll see you tomorrow. We're here every day, 12 to 2. The impromptu concert. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I was there for the love of it. You must tell the truth. I'm sure everyone's perspective is unique. There's a lot of truth about the pain of being an immigrant, mm. but they're jokes. We find the funny. It's our strength. At what point do you think women's health care will stop being a political issue? When half of Congress can get pregnant. Ran out of words, but we do what we do. We mm. don't have no board, so we got to trade twos. So we trade twos, I was just really dope groove. And Allison was so nice to meet you.
for those of you, oh, hey, oh, they really do work in a mill. Oh, okay, now I can use my inside voice. Um, again, thank you so much for coming to October Get Lit with All of It Book Club. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Allison Stewart. I host WNYC's Afternoon Arts and Culture Show, where if you listen regularly, you know we love books. We are so excited to have this book club. Want to let you know that we're actually recording this to air on the show in about a week or so. So feel, so feel free to clap and cheer and laugh, and it's great that we can, you know, I used to have to imagine you all doing that at home when we were doing this virtually, so it's so nice to see all of you. As was mentioned, we are going to hear from Lori Anderson in just a little bit. Also want to let you know that AM is so kindly going to sign books in the lobby after the event, and we will announce our November book at the very end, so we're very excited about all of that. A.M. Holmes is an award-winning author. You may know her novels, May We Be Forgiven. This book will save your life. Of course, she's an accomplished screenwriter and producer. The Unfolding is her first novel in more than a decade. And thanks to our partners here at the New York Public Library, 2,358 readers were able to check out an e-copy of the book to read along with us this month. That's so exciting. On top of all the people who I'm sure bought it at their favorite local bookstore. So let's welcome A.M. Holmes. Thank you so much. <clears throat> There's nothing better than being in a library. Libraries are the best. The title, it's not the the unfold, the the unraveling, the undoing, the unmaking, it's the unfolding. Why the unfolding? Cuz life is but an origami. <laughs> <laughs> um because I think there's so many things that the book is looking at whether it's large scale sort of socio-political aspects of our culture and history, and also things that are kind of um, becoming known within a family and mm. and awakenings also within the family. So, uh, you know, titles are difficult, but <laughs> we do what we can. When did the title come into the process for you? Was it the title About first? two days before the last minute, or maybe just after the last minute, I think, in this particular case. For real, really? Yeah, there, there were other titles in the works. Um, it's, it, it can be difficult. I will say this one was a little mm. bit difficult in that way. I shouldn't admit that <laughs> so broadly, but it was. When did you actually start writing this book? As a small child, I think growing up in Washington, D.C., <laughs> I was taking notes. Um, you know, I think that this book, the, the actual writing of it started well before Donald Trump was even a candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking at ideas actually in a short story called A Prize for Every Player that was in my last book, which is a collection called Days of Awe. And in that story, a man goes with his family shopping in a big box store. And by the time they check out, he's been nominated to run for president by the other shoppers. I've, I had the feeling, I know, it seems plausible. They print the banners in the home office section and so on. Um, and actually, I think we're going we're gonna to try and make an opera out of that. Um, that's a whole other thing okay. coming down the road. But, follow follow um, up on yeah, opera. Thanks for right, exactly. <laughs> Note on opera. Um, but I, my sense was quite a long time ago that the American political system, not any one side, had lost track of the American people. And it became sort of its own world that was only about politicians serving themselves. And that made me very uncomfortable. And then there was the influx of what we now call dark money mm -hmm. uh, that has just grown exponentially. And so I thought there was something happening with it too. When the lack of a politician's desire to represent people and the rise of dark money dovetail, it gets complicated. It was so interesting in, in one of our comments, someone, when we announced the book, said, I don't know if I can read about Trump in 2016. And we immediately, you know, I got on their Instagram, no, really, it's about, it's about 2008. It's a whole different place. What has it been like to try to talk to people about this book, given that 2016 is so top of mind for everyone? Right. I mean, even I'm still not over, you know, January 6th yeah. by any means. So um, I think it's interesting because I think that, that, that the seeds – of how we as a country got from 2008, but even really the end of World War II to where we are now, that's, that's the real mental time span for me, are, are sown all throughout. And mm -hmm. so I look at that election, you know, the night of Obama's election here in New York City, A, I got a bigger TV, because that was like a big thing for me. I had my college 13 inch, I was like, gotta go big. <laughs> uh, so I got like this big, I don't know if you guys, they don't even make that anymore. But, and had friends over, and you know, when Obama won, we were like, yay, and we all went out in the street and there was celebration. And the sense that there was a kind of hope and a new possibility mm -hmm. and a new beginning for many people in this country. And then I also think in some ways that uncorked 
a barely latent, incredible racism and sexism and really fear of other people losing power or what they thought was theirs exclusively. Um, some people are not good sharers. Mm. On election night, where does the big guy see himself in the world, his place in the world? Well, early on election night, <laughs> before the results are in, I think he's he's somewhat concerned, and he is mm -hmm. he is in Phoenix, Arizona, which is where the McCain campaign is based and where they have set up for their victory party. Um, and I think he sees himself as a as a, a guy who gets stuff done, you know, who can kind of pull strings. And obviously, he's there, and he's you know, he's a player in a certain way. Um, and then by the end of the evening, he really thinks he and his cohort have really not been paying attention. And I think that to some degree that, that, you know, they may have assumed that they had powers that they didn't have. Mm. Um, yeah. We get engagement on our Instagrams where we post questions throughout the month before the event. And someone commented, I had a hard time with the book at first because I had a hard time caring about a Republican, the big guy. But then I got into it because his daughter was so wonderful. Yeah. Which I thought was it. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it, there's so many things to say about that because on the one hand, and this comes up a lot, people are always, even my like, friends, my, my very first readers, I give them the book and they're like, am I supposed to like these people? And I'm like, that's irrelevant mm -hmm. in the sense that I'm writing always about very different experiences than my own. And part of why I'm doing that is because I want to understand them and I need to inhabit another world and think, how does this come to be? Who are these people? Um, you know, how did they get there? What are they thinking? What do they need and want and so on? So the big guy is, he's not easy by any means. And he is, I think, offensive to many people for good reason. Um, his daughter, Megan, votes for the first time in 2008. And their love of history is a thing that bonds the two of them. But also for me, it was an important thing to talk about what does it mean to grow up and to begin to differentiate yourself from your family and to sort of think, oh, do I buy into the narrative, which is a story that mm -hmm. families and societies, we all tell ourselves about things, or do I begin to sort of define myself not in full acceptance of that? And so that is the beginning of a, a brand new sort of journey and, and a kind of awakening for Megan that is ongoing. We asked people what name they would give the big guy. Yeah. If they could give him oh, a that's name. A good one. Uh, someone said Gus, <laughs> Rex, yeah. uh -huh. Donald. Mm. How did you land on the big guy? I think it's interesting. So the big guy, somewhere in the book, I think his name does appear once, and I've even forgotten what it is. Uh, he is the big guy. He is the guy who takes up too much space, who thinks really well of himself, but doesn't realize the way in which he intrudes on the space and time of others. Um, and I think he he is someone that we all live with um, in many different iterations. So it was important to me that he not be defined by a name. I pictured him being a man spreader on the subway. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the guy, you know, the thing too is that there is, there is, I mean, there's so many kinds of coming to consciousness in the book. There is a piece of it too where he begins to realize, like, what if I'm a jerk? What if I'm really not the kind of, you know, generous person who takes such good care of everybody? But what if I'm really not a good person? And that he can't live with himself knowing that. So there are levels of awareness. What is it that he feels he needs to protect after election night 2008? That's a good question. I think for me, that question, I, I, I'm looking at it now literally every day when I'm looking at what's going on in our political system. I think there are some people who feel right now the need to preserve power at any cost. Mm. Um, and so I think he, and, and it's interesting, my editor in England wrote to me and said, I'm confused because this guy talks about protecting and preserving democracy. And yet, it seems like he and his friends are trying to overthrow the government. I go, yes, why? Well, there's no confusion then. <laughs> um, and she's like, but wait. <laughs> you know? mm. And so the idea even of what does democracy mean, and we have to remember too, when, when democracy in America was first founded, women didn't vote, people mm -hmm. of color didn't vote, there's still a lot of effort made to keep a lot of people from voting. So part of what he wants to protect and preserve is himself you know, and his ownership of all. His democracy. His democracy, exactly. Let's talk about this group of men, the big guy is recruited. You've got amateur historians, some 
odd military men, some doctors. Yeah. They're all of sort of unique, I'll use the word. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> how did you decide what characters would populate this group of men? Sure. So the Forever Men, which is a, a cohort he pulls together, is modeled after the Eisenhower Ten, which were ten men that Eisenhower sent secret letters to uh, near sort of almost the end of his administration that were basically along the lines of, in case of nuclear war, you are in charge of agriculture and you are in charge of communication. Um, and they were secret to like 15 years ago. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know they existed. And I wanted these men to represent different aspects of healthcare, of the judiciary, of the military. Um, but I also really wanted to push them out a little into the sort of Dr. Strange lovey, surreal, like a heightened coat of color, overly saturated world, because I was trying not to compete with reality. And then reality just kept galloping it's up behind me. Weirder and weirder. I know. Uh, yeah. Interesting. What was your research like? How did you stumble on the Eisenhower Ten? How did did you did you watch a lot of Fox News? Did you read I can't a lot of the Washington that. Times? Yeah, no, did exactly. you read the editorial page right. of the Journal? I, I'm yeah. curious about what you did. I did try to. I, I do I, every now and then. I do try to watch Fox News, and I and I I start mm -hmm. stuttering. Um, <laughs> it's it's so much more upsetting than I could possibly even imagine. Um, I can't even start with that. But so I, I read a lot of history. I read a lot of books by political figures. So I'll read, you know, what is John McCain writing about himself? What are John McCain's speechwriters writing? What is really, you know, when they when Eisenhower talked about that rise of the military industrial complex, that also is a huge shift in the economy. And mm -hmm. it sounds so weird to say this, but when we study fiction or literature, we never talk about economics. But how people live their lives and move through their lives is so much about economics. If you are rich, if you are poor, if you share a room with somebody else, if you don't have a home, the story changes profoundly. So I'm secretly super interested in that and the way that plays out through things. So I, I read a lot, and I, I, I love history. I did deep, deep research. I once had a fellowship across the street in the library, and it's just the best place to go, you know? So I'm, I'm in the books. I'm curious when you're reading politicians, either memoirs or their their take on this particular yeah. time in history, how self-aware do they seem to be? Was like was John McCain when you read his? Did he seem like a self-aware person? I would say the majority of self of politicians, even if they were self-aware or had any qualities of that, it certainly doesn't come through in those books. Those are kind of like slightly grandstandy, you know, let me tell you more about myself books. Um, but they, they're they not ones to show vulnerability. And I think self-awareness might be an indication also of vulnerability. It's also an opportunity to write your story before someone else does. Absolutely. And maybe tells more of the truth about you. <laughs> well, absolutely. I, I, yeah, I would say I don't think, I don't read those books thinking this is the true version. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just, this is the construction. We never really fully know what the big guy and the forever men have as a plan. You don't have to tell me, do you know what the plan is? I think we're seeing the plan. I think we're in mm. the plan. Did you, were you ever tempted to let us know specifically, clearly what they had in mind? No. Uh, and here's why, because mm -hmm. the whole book takes place over 77 days. So I would say, do I know more about the plan? Absolutely. Are we seeing literally, and I, I'm not being facetious by saying, are we seeing the effects of men very much like the big guy and his cohort, cohort, what they've done between 2008 and now? We're seeing that every day in the way the kinds of information we're getting, the kinds of narratives that are being spun. Um, but I didn't think it would be appropriate within 77 days for them to have the whole thing fully planned out. One of the things they talk about is that they wish to be invisible. And the more invisible they are, the more dangerous they are. And I think that's entirely mm -hmm. true. And we're at a moment now where, you know, you drop a pebble in here and the rings go out. But at a certain point, you can't trace where that pebble started. And so with all the sort of noise and I don't, it's not information, but I keep calling it narrative that's out there. We don't know where it stops and starts. And that makes it really much more difficult to also navigate. Let's talk about something more fun. Yes. You got it's to, a really funny book, too, by the it way. It is funny. It's very <laughs> funny. And you get yeah. to write about real people. John McCain, yeah. George Bush, Condoleezza Rice. Um, what was fun about getting to create voices for people that we already know? We know something about, but you could take some creative license. Sure. So, I mean, the, it's it's totally fun um, because <laughs> on the one hand, you get to do like research like, oh, so 
there's a whole scene where they're talking about John McCain on the night of the election, and they're saying, oh, you know, I hear John's a gambler, and apparently he was a bit of a gambler. And they'll say, and I hear he has, like, you know, lucky items, and one of them talks about a lucky feather. And John McCain did have a lucky feather, and he did, you know, he kept losing his various lucky items on the campaign plant plane, and then all the aides would freak out, like, John lost his ball. You know, it's just <laughs> like, oh, my God. Um, and so all those kinds of things were really interesting. And then Condoleezza Rice, who's at a Thanksgiving dinner that Megan goes to, talking about her family and how she grew up and her dad and, and the interest in, in – he was, a, I think, a preacher and a football mm -hmm. coach. So all that's true. And then there's a – part that I get all excited, I'm like, hysterically funny, when they visit George Bush right before he's about to leave the White House, and he gives Megan a whole lot of Air Force One M&Ms. Now, Air Force One M&Ms are a real thing. And originally, when uh, Kennedy was president, you had cigarettes on Air Force One, right? So everyone got a pack of, like, cool cigarettes. I was like, oh, I'm on Air Force One. Um, and then when there was no more smoking on planes, uh, Ronald Reagan came in, and it was jelly beans. And then after Reagan left, everyone was like, no, we don't want to do jelly beans anymore. So they settled on the presidential M&M. &M. Um, you can buy these on eBay. And <laughs> they are in boxes signed by each president. But there's also some that are unsigned, which are transition M&Ms. Um, <laughs> lots to know. It sounds like a punk, That's the kind of, can you imagine the research <laughs> I had to do? Right, exactly. Transition, transition M&Ms. I'll be blue. <laughs> Let's talk about the family, because yeah. the family story is really touching and moving and funny as well. I mean, it's as much a book about a family in dysfunction as yeah. he's trying to fix the world. His family is having troubles of their own. Um, does the big guy see the situation with his wife, Charlotte? Does he see that her alcohol intake is not um, an amped up social intake, right. but it's actually a problem. alcoholism? Yeah. yeah, alcoholism. I think certainly... You know, by early in the book, he he he. I, I would say he probably already knew that, but it becomes untenable pretty quickly. Um, and I think, in a way, we're already sort of at that moment at the beginning, but it takes us a little bit to get there. You know, and Charlotte for me was on the one hand, I joke and say, if, if Joan Didion and Ron and and Nancy Reagan kind of melded, they would be Charlotte. But everyone's like, that's not possible. <laughs> um, there are certain things that defy the laws of science. Um, but, you know, I look at Charlotte and I think of, of people like Martha Mitchell, John mm -hmm. Mitchell, uh, Nixon's attorney general, who there was actually a psychiatric term defined, the Marshall, Martha mm -hmm. Mitchell effect, which is real. Uh, Pat Nixon, Betty Ford. It's hard to be a political wife. It's hard to be a woman who grows up. And part of the thread, too, is the multi-generational look at women's lives from Charlotte and Meghan, who grows up being asked, what kind of man do you want to marry? Not who do you want to be or what do you want to do with your life? And so that was also important. I wanted to weave the large scale, kind of what we call the great American novel, which I always joke just means pretty good big book, uh, with the more intimate domestic. And the truth is, historically in our country, the great American novel is written by men and women write books about home life. And I really, it was important to me to claim both spaces mm -hmm. and weave them together and kind of like, you know, put an end to the idea that there's one can do one or the other. And then it was so difficult. Someone said to me, well, who is your book for? I was like, people? Humans. Readers? <laughs> yeah. Since you said Martha Mitchell, because she was a truth teller. Absolutely. She was, yes. she was the truth teller during, during the Nixon Yeah, she would call drunkenly, but she would call journalists at night and tell them what was happening. And the Nixon administration silenced her and at one point literally kidnapped tranquilized her. her and kidnapped her. So I, as I like to say, you can't make it up. I mean, At one point, Charlotte tells the big guy, I keep thinking one day my life will begin. What is it that makes her feel like her life hasn't started? I feel that way, too. Don't you ever feel that way? I'm like, just waiting. It's going to start sometime soon now. <laughs> That's like a movie. This is all just the previews. Um, I think that she's, she feels like she put everything on hold, and she has yeah. yet to have a chance to, to become who she is. Um, and I think, you know, as we move forward in the book, I don't think she's even quite there yet, but I think were there to be a sequel, there would be a lot more to say about Charlotte and Megan. The big guy really loves her, doesn't he? Yeah. Because for all of his faults, yeah. it's the place where he is the most human, the most thoughtful, the most caring, even if it doesn't, he doesn't know how to do right. it. <laughs> right. he, he wants to do it. He, yeah. he, theirs is a true love? Yeah. I mean, I think in the, in the way that the big guy doesn't realize 
that he's trapped his family. You know, that he thinks he's like provided so well for them, but they're caged in some way. And so part of his awakening and his growing growing up in some ways is to realize you need to give people space to find themselves and to go out in the world. There's also a moment, which again, in the talk about the dark humor, where he's having a bonding moment with Megan and they're at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. And she's like, you know, Dad, is there anything that you would have wished to have done with your life differently or that you w would have wanted to become? And he's like, yeah, there is something. There's something I wished I'd invented. The atomic bomb. And I just think, who thinks that? You know, but to me, that's like both hysterically funny and so disturbing mm -hmm. because of the grandiosity and the arrogance of it. So, you know, and she's like, oh, you know, oh. <laughs> I've said you this to this yeah. this to you before that one of my favorite exchanges is Megan and the cab driver. And when the cab driver challenges Megan on who she voted for and Megan sort of assumes he's a Barack Obama supporter yeah. and he's voted for McCain. He just wanted her to uh, he wanted to know why. He was yeah, he wanted challenging to, yeah. her the depth of her commitment to her vote which I thought was a really interesting way of introducing that she doesn't really know why she did it, or right. just because mom and dad did it, I guess. Right, and because he believes in the things we all believe in. It's like, well, doesn't Obama believe in those same things? And which is also interesting, too, of what, what people mm -hmm. feel they are voting for when they're voting for somebody, and even their understanding of what that might mean. Uh, so, yeah, Mr. Tooth Taxi is, is uh, yeah. I'm going to ask a few more questions, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Some of our producers will come around with microphones, so think, get ready with your questions. All right, so this is the spoiler alert for anybody uh -oh. who hasn't finished the book yet. Too bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Megan mom, learns, mom, don't listen to this part. <laughs> so Megan learns the, learns the huge secret that's been kept from her, that her parents had an infant who died after only a few weeks. Her mother is not, Charlotte's not her biological mother. Her father had an affair with another woman who gave birth to Megan. This is sort of a big question. What does this do to her sense of self? Just really initially. I think atomic bomb is a good, it's mm -hmm. a good sense of it. I mean, I think... I wanted to talk about that sense. I, I'm very interested in the ways in which identity is a story. And both as a fiction writer, but we don't we don't often acknowledge that in our lives. That you know, in every family there's like, oh yeah, uncle so and so who disagreed with the story of the family, so he's the black sheep and we don't see him anymore. So for Megan to have her identity disrupted, and her biological father is the big guy, he mm -hmm. is her father, but She's a, she is not Charlotte's daughter, which is part of Charlotte's alcohol problem. The secret has been kept for too long. Um, it completely unsettles her, but it also prompts her to really have to take ownership of herself, mm -hmm. which again, to me, these are all universal things that we all have to do, but it's like, how do you sort of illustrate that in a way that sort of puts it f front of the burner a little bit more? Why do you think this trauma splintered this couple as opposed to brought them closer together? That's a very good question. I would say, I think because in some ways they didn't talk about it. They didn't mm -hmm. deal with it together. I think the complexity of being a couple that has lost a child often separates yeah. f families anyway. And the fact that he doesn't tell Charlotte that mm -hmm. Megan is his daughter, which is a problem. So I think lack of truth and, and either at some points too, you know how in life, there's some ways that at some points in time you have more or less capacity to deal with something. And it's interesting because even as you get older, you might actually have more capacity to deal with something that's extraordinarily painful earlier, or it can undo you permanently. People are complicated. That's why I love, I mean, in all seriousness, you know, I look at the big guy and this family and I think people are like, he's a bad person, but he's not entirely a bad person because none of us are entirely good or bad. And even if we might be highly morally inclined, we also do things. I mean, that's why sort of in Judaism, we just had, you know, the days of atonement where we, you apologize for things you didn't even do, it turns out, <laughs> just things you might've thought about once. Um, so I think that interests me. I mean, it really mm -hmm. does. That just human behavior is always at the core of what I'm looking at. The person I think I'd most like to have coffee with is Tony. Tony's very cool. Tony is a cool guy. Yeah. So Tony is the big guy's best friend from, I think, either high school or college, mm -hmm. early on. And he is a closeted gay Republican in Washington, D.C., and was modeled in some ways on, I think, men I saw 
and didn't understand when I was growing up. And I was like, there were always, there, you know, Washington has a history of having a lot of gay people and, and gay men in service to politicians. Uh, Jack Kennedy's best friend was a gay guy. Roosevelt had gay men in proximity. And part of it was at that point in history and time, gay men didn't have families. They didn't get married. They didn't have lives. So they could work really hard for yeah. people. And then we also have had like the lavender scare and certainly as a kid growing up in D.C. when the AIDS epidemic hit, I saw a lot of men who had lost contact with their families mm -hmm. and people who died. And so Tony is very impacted by that. And his view becomes less about sort of overt Republican or Democratic philosophy and a much longer game. Um, and he's somebody who sort of travels with the office of president. He's the, you know, he's the fixer in Washington. He seemed wise to me. Yeah, I love Tony. Let's get to some audience questions. We kind of come down here, and Jordan's going to hold on to the mic. Okay. Hi. Uh, first, I like the book a lot. Uh, my question is about Megan. All right. As we just said, she discussed her life, her issues with the taxi driver. She talks to Tony, and she talks to the scribe. Where are girlfriends in her life? That's a really good question. I don't know. No, I didn't think about it. God, I wish we'd had this conversation a couple months ago. <laughs> um, that is a really good question. You know, I would say to me, Megan, at the beginning of the book, I mean, she's definitely this very sort of sheltered kid, um, is also that, that kid I feel like I've met too many times who you meet them at like 17, 18, and they seem very vague and kind of like, you think, what are you interested in? They're like, I don't know. And you're like, they're like, are you applying to colleges? Yeah. And you're like, you're never going to get in. <laughs> like, you know, um, but, you know, that, that young person who doesn't mm -hmm. seem awake on any level yet. And I think, for me, this was about Megan waking up. And I remember early on also thinking, I hope she does wake up because mm -hmm. it's, she, it's not very interesting until somebody does. But I think that's a super good question of where are, you know, girlfriends and female confidants. I don't know. I'll have to ask her. But certainly if I write more about Megan, if there's a little sequel, um, I'll be chatting with her about that. Very good question. Uh, any other questions? Uh, thanks. I feel like there's a common theme in your work around um, the perpendicular nature between the origin of where people come from and where they end up. Um, and I wonder if you ever considered making Megan a boy. Oh, interesting. Uh, no, but um, mm. uh, but I think that's interesting. I mean. I wonder why why I would make Megan a boy. So, the, I think the the that the difference between the big guy and the offspring isn't gender, but the difference in like sort of exploring the the different ways of being male. Sure, I would say that's really interesting, and that would be a different book in yeah. in in mm -hmm. so many ways because one of the threads too is that all of the forever men sort of lament that they don't have a male successor. And then I think by the end of the book, the big guy actually, again, in his sort of awakening, realizes, hey, I have this incredibly great daughter. Hey, a daughter could actually do things too. So he actually sees that Megan is smart and is capable, um, but it's not about his masculinity or whatever. It's more about him realizing women can do things too. And, and to me, that was actually a big step for him. Um, but were Megan to be you know, a, a boy, it would be different. But I'm not, I'm not opposed to writing a different version because I think mm -hmm. that is also an interesting relationship to look at. No, you know, in all seriousness, Megan and Charlotte in, that, in the sort of multi-generational, as I said, aspect of how women's lives both have changed and have not changed is really interesting to me. And I think equally, men have struggled about what does it mean to be a man? I mean, we're, nothing about the mm -hmm. time we live in is easy. Um, and how do you... What does it mean to be a good man? How do you, you know, make space for women? How do you make space for, for other people? Um, it's complicated. Yeah, totally. Now, so I've got, I've got to make, a, I got to add a boy and I got to get her some friends. friends. So the sequel is already <laughs> underway. It's coming along. I feel like I got at least 50 pages the tonight. Secret son. <laughs> in the secret son. Totally, <laughs> exactly. Hi there. Um, I'm over here. <laughs> uh, number one, a, a compliment. I loved the whole sequence. I think it was somewhere in the middle. I was listening to the audiobook, by the way. Well done. Um, where uh, Thanksgiving, yeah. where the big guy was sort of alone. And that 
seemed to go on for a long time. And I loved that it that it really unfolded on multiple levels. But it also drew attention to me that um, there's a lot of dialogue mm-hmm. in the book. And that was all of a sudden where he was alone. He wasn't talking to as many people. So I, so that's a compliment. My question is about like your process maybe, like where you're trying to decide, but bet- do you think about like how much dialogue am I putting here as opposed to narrative? Sure, that's a good question. Uh, first off, it's funny because like people are like, you can't put double Thanksgiving in a book. Like that's not allowed. You're only allowed one of each holiday. You can't like double down on it. Nobody eats Thanksgiving twice. But also that was in a way a little bit about his consumption and his and and that you know there, it's never enough, right? So that was a piece of that. And then, uh, in terms of the dialogue, again, you know, I, I didn't. The truth is, I didn't notice it. I wanted, I wanted when the big guy and his cohort were together. I wanted them to look and sound somewhat different than when the family is together. And I felt like I wanted just to give these people space to to be and talk. And I didn't need to say, Tony looks over his shoulder and sees the wilting orchid and thinks of himself. You know, like Mm -hmm. it was just like, you know, oh, you know, so I didn't want to sort of add a lot of commentary. And I think the other piece of it is that my sort of mentors in that way, both literal and kind of, um, as I always describe, you have invisible mentors, are Edward Albee, Harold Pinter, the playwright Carol Churchill. And in fact, the scene where Charlotte's at the bottom of the pool with the pennies, that's from Carol Churchill, Churchill's play, Scriker. Um, not literally, but kind of. Um, so, you know, evoking those kinds of images. And I, I'm really interested in the, the, the way that the forever men spin each other up and kind of you know, somebody said to me last night, do they even know what they're saying when they're talking? I'm like, not necessarily. Mm-hmm. So it's not even clear that you could be planning to overthrow the government, but what are you saying? Uh, do you know what you're talking about? But the way they kind of egg each other on, I think is also to me a reflection of, this can sound sort of weird, but the speed of the news cycle, the frenetic kind of way that we all grind on all this stuff. And I wanted that to have the speed that you would only get with a lot of dialogue and not... Um, you know, like, I don't know, is it the David Mamet version of, you know? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm thinking about something you said earlier, yeah. and I had mentioned to you once before that I thought it was interesting that people were at a lot of parties yeah. throughout the book. And then I realized it's that holiday season between the fourth and inauguration yes, exactly, day. Yeah. And that is also a time when people are heightened feelings and heightened feelings about family and heightened feelings about just about everything. You can everything. have a short fuse. You can, uh, you know, read into people's body language. This person said this to me, and, I, and I'm feeling vulnerable because I'm alone. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Just hit me the seventy. That, yeah, that, it that's is a exactly time. right. <laughs> and it's so funny because those are supposed to be the best part of the year, and it is like mm-hmm. the most difficult part of the year. Yeah, I know. I should write like a cranky book called "The Most Difficult Part of the Year," <laughs> and then make it into an Adam Sandler movie. <laughs> and then you'll be rich. Um, any other questions from the audience? We've got one in the back in here, and then we will. Jordan, yeah. I think I think you mentioned that your editor is in the UK, and then you also mentioned some readers who I assume are Americans. What kind of different feedback did you get, and how did you incorporate that into your uh, drafts? Well, what my US editors here. Um, so <laughs> I, I love, you know, it's weird. I, like, I really love the editorial process, and I love mm-hmm. cutting stuff, which makes me probably weird for a writer. I'm like, let's cut more, let's cut more. Um, so uh, lots, lots of conversations with with Andrea, my editor, who's here, and editors in England, and 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 a few different people. I don't have a lot of people who read my work, um, but you know, asking for me to drill down on things, asking questions about things, um, all kinds. It's just a lot of back and forth, and a lot of sometimes just going out to lunch and talking about ideas. I find that it's funny because you know. I live in my head, you know, mm. exactly. And so I can be thinking about a book, but sometimes it doesn't really get started till like I go have lunch, which I never do normally. I don't eat lunch. Um, and then actually start talking about it. And you're like, oh yeah, and then this could happen and that could happen and then these other people could come in. If I'd had lunch with you, I w- there would be friends. I mean, I just have to, <laughs> I clearly have to sort of at least get out of the house a little bit more. Um, so that was part of it, yeah. And it's, but there was, the one thing I will say is it is interesting my books come out in a lot of different countries and in a lot of different languages. And I do think they're very American. On the one hand, I think, wow, that's so cool that they come out in these other countries. I also think sometimes they might be better understood in other countries. Because here people are on the fence like, are you making fun of us? Mm. Or are you serious? And I'm like, well, um, you know, I'm not making fun of us, 
but I have to laugh at us and have to sort of note the absurdity of things because number one, it would be too excruciatingly painful if I didn't, but it's definitely, um, with love. I mean, I really, you know, I'm, I'm deeply invested for better and worse in what it is to be American. And I think we have time. Did you want to ask one more question? Do you want wait one second? Let's bring the mic up so that everybody can hear you. Jordan's coming. And for the radio. Okay, so in the in the beginning of the book, um, you know, there's this reaction to the McCain loss and and oh, this terrible, all these terrible things are gonna happen. But those terrible things were never like really explicitly yeah. mentioned. And the assumptions were never, there was never like a because, you know, after these thoughts. And I I, reading it, I kind of felt like I was, I was thinking about my Democratic neighbors who sometimes yeah. do the same thing, and I, I wondered if, if there was, if you were trying to get at that too. Wait, the, the question of the the really bad things that are going to happen because and the, the the not following up the fear with the because or being explicit about your fear of what will happen the other party the other party. Well, that's a really good question. Right, right. I mean, I think the the first piece of what you're asking about, which to me is super interesting, is I think that we are living in a time where there is enormous fear of the other and enormous desire or need to make people the other. So as soon as we, you know, and, it, and I see this a lot when people are like, oh, like people seem to want to read to see themselves. And I think, well, to me, I want to read to see anything but myself, right? Please yeah. get me out of here. Like, I don't need to see that. But you know, the the idea that anything that is that we can say, oh, that's not me, or to become more tribal or divide us, we're, we're getting more and more fractured in that way. So I think by not naming what the fears are is, is scarier than naming them to me, mm. um, because it's like it could be anything. Um, and that's really where terror lurks, right? Um, so that's that's a piece of that, if that makes any sense. Um, Should yeah. we bring Lori up? Yeah, totally. Everybody, Lori Anderson is a multimedia artist, director, composer, and inventor, and friend of AM Homes. Her artwork, uh, there's a virtual reality exhibition of her artwork on 14th Street currently, and this year is the 40th anniversary of her first studio album, Big Science. She's also a New York Public Library Lion for 2002. <laughs> One of the honorees. 2022, thank you. <laughs> oh, I went back, back in time. In time. <laughs> we've been having, yeah, we've been time traveling tonight. Um, you, Lori will be recognized on Monday. Thank you so much for making time. We really appreciate it. Well, I'm here uh, because I love AM, and, and her book is just Colossal. It's just so amazing. So I'm really happy to be here to celebrate well, it. <laughs> what were some of the, the questions that AM's book brought up for you, Lori, or things that you were thinking about after you finished? You know, one of them that I, I, I just realized that was, um, well, of, of course, Us and Them, you know, mm -hmm. was the biggest one because of what's going on and, and um, in, in our country and also the way that these characters tend to make the, the rest of the world unreal. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and that um, process of making the other per, the others unreal is when you make someone unreal, then you can kill them. So it, it was a hair-raising book to read. I mean, and, and one, also when you mentioned that a uh, big guy hadn't uh, told Charlotte that, that he was Megan's father, I had, f I had weirdly suppressed that incredible yeah. detail, and of course I read it. And uh, but um, the uh, uh, it was truly terrifying, and that level of betrayal of a of a man mm -hmm. on a personal level just um, that was the linchpin for me of the book. It just went whoa. Uh, what is what is um, what is loyalty? What is betrayal? What what, what do you want? You know. Yeah. So uh, it, it's a really amazing amazing uh, work of art. This book. Am um, how did you and Lori meet? If I can ask. Oh wow! Um, how did I? <laughs> <laughs> I have a memory of Lori outside of Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., in like oh, yeah. climbing a tree <laughs> outside, outside of Constitution <laughs> Hall. Um, and then, and then uh, a good friend of mine, Leanne Unger, was Lori's sound engineer for a long time, and then driving Lori and Leanne around in my oh, yeah. brown Honda Civic. <laughs> uh, and, and 
where there were so many people in the car that somebody's hair got stuck in the sunroof and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. It's a long time, yeah. a really long time ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The eight, 80s, maybe. In the 80s, yeah. yes. In the 80s, yeah. yes. That's yeah. how you know you're a good friend. You can't actually remember the no, day. I, no, I actually don't remember. <laughs> I never yeah. didn't no. know you. No, I know. I was like, oh. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to, to brag on each other. Lori, what do you admire about AM's writing? And AM, what do you admire about Lori's writing? Um, uh, the voices. Uh, it's, it, for me, it's, um, it's, these are plays, you know, and, and, uh, and operas. And, and uh, each voice has such a, a, an incredible amount of uh, uh, texture in it. So I, I could really hear the book. And, and it, to me, I agree with whoever was saying that about, um, it's mostly in quotes. So I, I just love the colorful way that you go into a world and learn about it from people saying, like you, like you say, you're not saying so-and-so was doing that, but they just talk, people talking. It's, it's amazing achievement to get that much information through people talking. So Laurie is a time traveler. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, for me, in all seriousness, so I look at Laurie, and I think Laurie is, besides being an incredible friend, but working on, on many platforms, making sculptures, making paintings, inventing things, Laurie is game. You'll be like, hey, Laurie, do you want to go, you know, to the moon? And she's like, oh, I was just there on Wednesday, but like, oh, yeah, we can go again. <laughs> um, you know, so, so, but, but doing that and, and, and play. And I will say, in all honesty, mm -hmm. you know, I think about we live in a world, and I, I, and I work with students all the time, where imagination is, is not encouraged. You know, we study things, we're supposed to pass these tests and do these things, but all of a sudden you're like, imagine this. And I think they're like, what do you mean? Mm. Like, why would I do that? I don't know how to do that, that's scary. And that's really what Laurie does. And I think we can't have a future if we can't imagine it, and on a pretty literal level. So when I say, what am I teaching? I'm teaching people to use their imaginations. Every day, Laurie is just taking that imagination <laughs> out there and playing with it. And so I, I am in awe of that always. Do you think students are being taught to be professionals? Because it seems like that sometimes to me. Mm -hmm. That I think they're there's like almost a there's a level of professional student. You know what I mean? That they, they yeah. no, they they come in with a resume, and you're like you're 12. They're like I know, but I've been very busy. <laughs> you know, uh, and even mm -hmm. no joking. You know, New York City. Some of you probably have had to do this, where you apply for nursery school. What are your hobbies? I'm like the kid is 18 <laughs> months old. I'm like bubble blowing. Um, <laughs> Likes libraries, chewing on books. Um, you yeah. know, it's and like he's 48 I mean, months on the yeah, planet. Totally. He's managed yes, to do X, Y, or Z. Right, has won the following awards. You know, <laughs> early crawling. You know? <laughs> well, and we there we we decided there was no delicate way to do this. I'm getting off stage. She's now. getting off stage <laughs> now. <laughs> we had this conversation Goodbye. already. Am <laughs> Holmes, thank you. And a, re a reminder: Am will be signing books in the in the lobby. Um, Lori, is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because as I always say on my show, because the internet, you never know. Violin was your first instrument, is that true? Yeah, yeah, we had a family orchestra and they were short on a violin, so I had, <laughs> there, were, there were lots of us, there were eight kids, and so we all played something. Is it an instrument you still pick up just because it moves you? It's right over there, but uh, I pick it up, yeah. <laughs> when, when does, do you, it, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is if you are having a day and what moves you to pick up your instrument and just play for you, not necessarily yeah, to um, make? A sense or... of loneliness sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, I play for that. Uh, and just to have some sound in the room. And, uh, uh, or sometimes I might have uh, some half a, of an idea. And, and I love music. I, I, the, it's just, I, I don't know why I play. I just love it. Your debut album, Big Science, was released in 1982, 40 years ago, and there's an anniversary vinyl edition. That's so cool. Um, how do you respond to anniversary? Some people, anniversaries are a big deal. It's a marker for some people. Not so much. Anniversaries um, can be uh, uh, very intense. To, today is the uh, ninth uh, anniversary of my husband's death, mm -hmm. and so it's always a... An amazing day for me to to uh, feel his um, presence. Uh, uh, although I do feel like he just w sort of walked out of the room a minute ago. So, <laughs> but it's it's always a a, a great day to think of of him and uh, and uh, kind of hear his voice a little bit. There was that wonderful exhibit 
the oh, yeah. summer. Right was, here at the library. Yeah, right down, here at the well, library. At the, at the Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center uh, is um, a show called Caught Between the Twisted Stars. And it's a lot of uh, loose um, instruments and writing and uh, a, lot of, a lot of things. So mm-hmm. if you haven't seen it, uh, uh, check it out. I, I think even if you're, if you're a musician, if you're a writer, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are w- one of those two things, you know. Um, uh, I think you'd find it interesting. We also put a lot of things in that were about really um, the the struggle of of uh, writing and making music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always and and also a lot of the failures as well. I mean, I, I get very encouraged when I when I read a book about somebody who is right, trying to do something and just failing. And I think that person failed. I, you know, that's just. Uh, Gives me heart, you know. So I really like to to hear that it's not that easy, you know, to do. Well, thank you for sharing today <laughs> with us. We <laughs> really appreciate it. You have your own work at Pratt Gallery on Fourteenth Street. It's a virtual reality exhibit. Could you explain to us what we'll see when we go, or what we'll exp- I guess what we'll experience when we go? This was with uh, my collaborator Shen Chen Wang, who really did most of the work. I have to say, uh, and he's uh, a wonderful. Um, uh, um, visionary, let's say. So we, we actually we made a, a lot of stories together, and and uh, then I just drew a lot of things because I I don't really like um, skin in VR. It looks very creepy. It never looks real. It looks really rubbery. So I said, let's make something that has no no. So I just it's all of all of my drawings actually, and so they're they're kind of animated, and it's called um, Chakram. There are two of them there actually. There was one called Chakram and Onto the Moon. And um, so it's like kind of getting lost in a in a world of words, and it's um, so you walk through a, a walk through a giant like uh, three dimensional library. What I mm-hmm. like about VR is really that you have to use your body. You know that when you when you see mm-hmm. a film, you know, you, and especially if it's a really good film, you at the end you're like you're oh. You're looking for your coat. You're getting your purse, and you've been like paralyzed for the whole thing. What's my name? I don't know. You know. So, <laughs> so and you stumble out of the theater. In, in VR, you need your body. You you're not like this at all. I'm not saying it's preferable to have just mm-hmm. be on a journey in your mind, but I really like being able to turn around and having to do things and touch things and move. And I think that's a really interesting future for film and that kind of language is to use the body because we're, we're getting out of the habit, you know? So it's really nice to have something that you can dance around in a little bit rather than just go, I'm, I'm absorbing it, you know, um, uh, that, the product. <laughs> You'd be uh, participatory yeah, yeah. in the, in the yeah, art. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're always, you seem to always be embracing technology. Some people run from it or get overwhelmed by it. How do you stay curious about technology and how do you stay open to it? I, I wouldn't say embracing. It's a pretty chilly thing to embrace. You know, it's like, I, I like it. I'm a geek for sure, but <laughs> I, uh, I don't trust it really. And I don't think it makes anything particularly better. Uh, my f- all-time favorite quote about it is from a cryptologist who said, you know, if you think technology is going to solve your problems, you don't understand technology and mm. you don't understand your problems. <laughs> and, you know, is it just your problem that you're just not fast enough or what? You know, and that'll make that'll make it faster, better. I don't know. At the same time, I think it, it works at a, at, at a different speed than other things. So it's, it can be very interesting to use. I guess we, if you think of it as another tool, rather well, than yeah. the mm-hmm. rather than the focus, well, where you use it, it doesn't use you. Tools can become the focus. I mean, if if I don't have an idea, I'll pick up a tool, and a, you know, I have to find your, your tools teach you things. If you mm. just play around, you know, um, and sometimes if you get an idea and force your tools to do it, it's a disaster because you 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 know you just kind of push it into the uh, material and it doesn't want to do that and it's just going to be in pieces on the floor. You know, you're just going to hammer on it too hard to try, try mm-hmm. to get that idea across because it's a mixture of of idea and, and material or let's say your material is color or or sound. So those are, are, are why we're not just writing essays and that's that's the meaning of the work. So that in in work that has material, half of the meaning is that. So, so I think... Um, 
that that combination of of things is uh, is what makes the difference between um, a an essay and a, a great work like the unfolding is it has so many so much texture in it. It's hard to believe it. We're on the tenth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy and, and Hurricane Sandy. It's, it's this weekend is the tenth anniversary. Is it? Yeah. How are you celebrating? We uh, we know we're actually tomorrow on the show. We're going to talk about how it has physically changed the city, uh -huh. the parts and, and people's lives, how their particular yeah. areas and the, either the property they owned or towns they lived in or areas have been have been changed, whether for the better or for the worse. And we're going to let people call in mm. and talk about that. Um, we just thought it would be good to also give people an opportunity to have voice on that on that day when they start to think about that time. And, and for people who don't know, you have a book, All the Things I Lost in the Flood, as well as the album Landfall, about the aftermath of the storm. Um, when did you realize you wanted to, to revisit those memories and in this way? Oh, that was kind of last minute. I was writing a lot of music, and then it just sounded like a storm. So I, mm. I put the text on top of it. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's a little bit jarring, but um, and it became... a uh, yeah, almost a cut-up that went over the music, so it wasn't made at the same time. You're going to perform for us. You're so kind to perform for I'm us. I'm going to read know a few things. Know. Oh, you're going to read? Okay, <laughs> yeah. we, we actually don't know. I'm, I'm excited to oh, find okay. out what it is. Okay, good, good. You ready? Um, yeah, here we go. All right, I'm going to get out of your way. <laughs> Gloria As I said, I think that there's so many amazing voices in on the unfolding, and here are some of them. I'll be blunt if I may. The big guy looks baldy, square in the eye. The bald man nods, we are concerned. The big guy pauses. In the event of decapitation, that we don't go all oh, Humpty Dumpty, and he can't bring himself to finish the sentence, but looks at Baldy, confirm that the content is clear. We are prepared, Baldy says. Like an alien life form, we walk among you. There are those who say the system of checks and balances has been gravely injured, but they need to know that the backbone of America is protected. The continuity of government goes beyond the Constitution, because in the event of the kind of emergency we anticipate in the 21st century, the provisions of the Constitution take too much for granted. The big noise from Renetka. What's the story? Metzger wants to know, what are you shopping for, I assume? It's not magic tricks. We're looking for someone who thinks along the same lines we do, the big guy says. Cut to the chase, Poe says. Post-election problem, America is in the crapper and we need to do something about it. We're not going to stand by and wait to see what happens. We're going to make something happen. And we need someone to put that idea out there in front of people. You want to spread ideas. Like a virus, Metzger says. You want them to be comforting. Like peanut butter and jelly. Like Sunday dinner. You want to low and seduce them, to numb them. So in the end, it's not a surprise because they saw it coming. They wanted to. I'm going to add a little icing to the cake, the doctor says. Memory. 
one can hold a thought on their head. There's no memory, no context, no history. You want to know why? I do, the big guy says. Antidepressants. 10% of the population takes them with women, and one of the side effects is that this affects memory. Billions more are hooked on opioids. The boys who make those pills are pulling in billions. And the black market is just as big. It's a public health epidemic. The herd is calling itself. It's like it's, let's say, it is kind of acceptable. Now, when men burst into tears, it's awkward. It's a rare thing. I have a small jar of men's tears collected during the last war. One of my truest treasures. But back to women. As for their names, women are basically all on a first name basis. The last name is just tacked on, it's hinged on, it can be broken off so easily. Marriage, boom, divorce, boom, you're suddenly just plain Ruth. Just plain Barbara. They keep losing their last names along the way. No wonder they're playing the crying card. They're missing half their names. Meanwhile, their father's name is plastered on their passport, their driver's license, all the official legal documents, and their mother's last name becomes a word so... obscure. It can actually be used as a secret password. Name of first pet. Favorite color. Mother's maiden name. A code word that unlocks your most secret. Information.
we're going to hear from Lou because this is a song he wrote about his father and there's so many amazing parents and children in the unfolding mm -hmm. and here he is singing about his mm -hmm. father Would you come to me If I was half drowning My arm above the last wave So 
sunny. A monkey then to monkey. I will teach you meanness, fear, and blindness. No social redeeming kindness. Oh, oh, state of grace. Thank you. Thanks for writing that book, Liam. It's a really great book. Mia Holmes, everybody. Thank you so much to Lori Anderson. That was so beautiful. And thank you to A.M. Holmes as well. Thanks to both of you for spending time with us. We're going to announce our November selection in a moment, but I want to say a couple of thank yous because we're polite. Um, thank you very much to our partners, the New York Public Library, for hosting us here. Brian Bannon, Giselle Dixon, Brandy McNeil, Michael Santangelo, Mariah Stuhl, Erica Parker, and Zena George. Thanks for hosting us and providing so many e-copies to our readers. And thanks to everyone from Park Boulevard Product. Park Boulevard Productions for helping us run the show and stream it online for everybody and our virtual viewers. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you to the folks at WNYC who put this on. Megan Ryan, Jordan Loft, Simon Close from Team All of It, Ed Haber, Chase Coulpon, excellent WNYC engineers who recorded all of this for the radio. Our next book announcement, we're going to be reading On the Rooftop by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. There it is. Cool cover. Uh, story follows three sisters who are known as the girl group The Salvations, directed by their mother, Vivian. The sisters have become a hot act in 1950s San Francisco in the Fillmore scene. But as the sisters grow older, their mother finds it more difficult to keep the group together. And as they try to break through nationally, Vivian worries the sisters might splinter apart forever. Margaret Wilkerson Sexton will be joining us right back here for a live event on Tuesday, November 22nd at 6 p.m. Starting on November 1st, New Yorkers can borrow an e-copy of the novel thanks to the library. You can pick one up outside today. We have some there for sale. And, of course, you can always go to your favorite local bookstore. Finally, follow us on Instagram at all of it, WNYC. That's where we host all of our book club discussions and make announcements. Thank you so much for spending time with us. We know time is precious, a non-renewable resource. So we really appreciate you spending part of your evening with us. Everybody get home safe. <laughs>